Nevertheless, the darkness will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian, and every warrior's sandal from his noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Well, Isaiah gives us a prophecy, a well-known prophecy of Messiah. Well known to us mostly because of our familiarity with Handel's great oratorio, Messiah. If you're like me, you've grown up hearing and listening to Messiah uh, for many, many years. I played in orchestras in Wisconsin and in college before that, and uh, I played the, played the trumpet with symphonies. And every other year, usually, we would perform Messiah, sometimes four, five, six performances. And so I had the privilege of playing this great work many, many times. And uh, if you know anything about it, you know, Handel didn't write a whole lot of parts for trumpet. So um, out of the, I think, 53 sections, 54 sections, there's only four or five that have trumpet parts. We play in, of course, the Hallelujah Chorus, which everyone knows, Glory to God in the Highest. The trumpet shall sound, but that's a solo, and a lot of times... You know, the orchestras will bring in an outside soloist to play that, so I didn't get to play that all the time. I played it a few times. Um, and then at the end, the final, Worthy is the Lamb, and the final chorus of Amens, Amens. The rest of the hours of rehearsal and performance, uh, that was a good time to bring a book, you know? We'd sit and listen, and, and, by, and I always say it was a great time to memorize Scripture because all of... Uh, Messiah is taken directly from Scripture. There's only one alteration to the Scriptures in, in Messiah. Did you know that? Uh, in uh, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and then the soprano takes over the, and sings, Come unto him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come unto him, and he will give you rest. He doesn't say, he didn't write, come unto me. He wrote, come unto him. It was Handel's invitation for people to come to Christ. It's a very beautiful moment. But it, virtually every word of Messiah is scripture. And one of the most famous highlights of that oratorio, of course, is the familiar chorus, for unto us a child is born, which uh, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That chorus, which comes in the first section, has become a Christmas holiday favorite uh, it's frequently performed as a standalone chorus during the Christmas season. And we've all heard its beautiful strains performed and by many great ensembles, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and my personal favorite, the Chicago Symphony Chorus and Orchestra. But um, it's a wonderful chorus. We've heard it performed and, and punctuated as Handel did in his uh, beautiful interpretation, as five titles given to the child who was born and the son given. In actuality, as we look at these names in the Bible, there are really four. The Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. It's four couplets, I suppose you could call it, um, each expressing a distinct attribute of who Jesus would be, who the Messiah would be, his identity and his character. And there's a great deal of truth and insight in these divinely inspired names. 
Now, there is some disagreement. I mean, even in my Bible here, there's a, a comma, wonderful, comma, counselor, comma, mighty God, comma. So there's a little bit of a disagreement on whether it's four names or five names. In fact, I, I, uh, I, I, when they, there's five Sundays leading up to Christmas, as there is this year, I'm able to do five messages because I take wonderful and counselor apart. Next week, we'll look at counselor. Uh, if there's only four Sundays, oh well, I can just cram them together as the Bible says and, and preach a, probably a more accurate biblical message, but at least uh, interpretation. But anyway, for sake of our study, I'm going to yield this year because we have five Sundays and because of my own musical bias. And we're going to consider the first of these couplets in two parts, wonderful, and then next week, wonderful counselor. After all, um, it's not just Handel's phrasing that leads us to consider this word wonderful as a divine attribute of Messiah, is it? Um, I like to take it apart and consider it separately because, well, let's face it, Jesus is wonderful, isn't he? It's a, it's a wonderful time of year, uh, most wonderful time of the year, as the song says, and it's a wonderful thing to consider what God has done for us in sending his son. Now, I know it should be four, but, uh, and, and by the way, in all the years I've been preaching through this text, I have never, ever had anyone come up to me and say, how dare you preach a sermon on the fact that Jesus is wonderful? I don't think anybody's going to object to that, would you? No. Okay, so that's okay. Today we'll look at the word wonderful. By the way, by way of introduction, I want to look at the text as it's given to us here. We'll pick up with verse six. Unto us a child is born. We've talked about this quite a bit. Unto us, just about those two words. What wonderful words those are. Unto us. Luke chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What a wonderful thing to know that God sent forth his own Son to be Savior of the world, but specifically unto us. Unto us who believe. That's what really makes Christmas so wonderful, isn't it? That the gospel is for us. We realize it's great to know that Jesus came to save the world, to save the sins of the world, to take away the sins of the world, but to know he came to take away my sin, that's a very special thing. That's what brings it home. It's like when you come downstairs on Christmas morning and... and uh, you know, you've had a visitor in the course of the night and, and there's presents piled up all around the tree. And, but there's one really big predominant one that's back kind of in the corner behind the tree. And you go and you look and, you, and it's for you, for me, this is for me. Wow, that's for me. Well, Jesus came for me. I want you to know that he came for you. And the greatest gift ever given the child that's born, the son that's given, is for us. Now, unto us, it says, a child is born. That, I believe, deals with Jesus' humanity. I mean, a child is born. That's a, a wonderful thing. It's a special thing when, in fact, we find out in chapter 7 that he was born to a virgin. Uh, and we'll get into that in a few minutes here. But the fact is, it's fairly normal that a child is born right? Uh, a child is born. I think that speaks to his humanity. But then it says, unto us a son is given. And I think that the fact that the child was born goes back to the prophecy in Genesis 3 and verse 15, where it says, your seed to the woman will <coughs> crush the serpent's head. Um, but now a son is given, specifically dealing with the fact that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is Emmanuel that was promised in chapter 7. He is God with us. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. That is God with us. And the Bible says in John 17 and verse 24 that the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world was laid. Jesus is the eternal Son of God and so he was the child born in the flesh, but in reality, he's the deity that's become flesh. He's the son that was given. 
And it talks about this, I think his office as the great high priest and his function in the function of his coming. It says the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now there's a lot of different understandings of what that actually means. I kind of agree with the one that talks about his function as a high priest. In Exodus chapter 28 and verses 6 through 14, the Bible says, that, talking about the ephod that was to be worn on by the high priest when he would go into the Holy of Holies to offer up his sacrifices and do his high priestly duty. His garments consisted of, I'll, I'll, I'll just call them shoulder boards. That's what we call them in the army. And they were basically, uh, they, they sat on his shoulder and they had stones that uh, two onyx stones that were engraved with the 12 tribes of Israel, six on each shoulder, being the heads of the tribes, indicating that Aaron would bear their names before the Lord as a memorial, as the representative when he went in to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. He wore the names of the tribes on his shoulders. The government was upon his shoulders. And we see that in Jesus. We see that he is our high priest. And he comes to take away our sins to make atonement for us. His name is written not on his shoulders, but engraved, the Bible says, on the palm of his hands. We see these names. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Reminding us of who he is as he came to be our high priest and take away our sins. I think that um, maybe it was last year we brought a message about these names and how they all associate with parts of the Trinity, the Godhead. Of course, mighty God, Jesus is God Almighty, come to earth. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But then we also see that he is everlasting Father, speaking of the Father. He is the Prince of Peace. Prince is the son of a king, right? So he's the son. And then the wonderful counselor, that's the function of the Holy Spirit that guides us and directs us into all truth. He's our comforter and our counselor, our paraclete, one who goes alongside of us. We see the mighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all embodied in these names. Colossians 2 and verse 9 tells us that in him, that is in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so we see that Jesus is all these things, all these names that are given. And so as we get into this today, we're going to look at the first of these descriptive names, or the first half of the first name anyway, if you will, that Jesus is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. We just sang that chorus. And, and the word wonderful here in, in Hebrew is an interesting word. It, it's a word, hella, uh, and it can be translated a lot of different ways. Wonderful, astonishing, unusual, amazing, extraordinary, surpassing, incomprehensible. It comes from a root word, pala or pali, which is diffi means difficult to be understood or incomprehensible. Again, extraordinary. Any or of all of these words could simply be used to describe Jesus. The obvious meaning of our English word wonderful is what? Full of wonders, right? Full of wonder. That's what it means. We sometimes use it in ways that are less appropriate. We, we, we do a lot of words that way. Um, we sang, his name is wonderful. He is the matchless king, master of everything. His name is wonderful. Problem is that we have trivialized words like this by our sloppy usage. You know, the latest one is epic. Don't you? Everything's epic, epic, epic. Taco Bell has epic tacos. Ep uh, you know, really? Uh, I mean, a, a, an epic is a really long, adventurous book, right? You know, it's a, it's a long book, uh, a story. We overuse these words. You know, epic tacos. And that's, that's incredible. Uh, wonderful. We describe people or meals. We had a wonderful meal on Thursday. Well, not really. I mean, it was very good. Bethany came and helped Julie cook, and we had a great meal. It was wonderful. It was delicious. But it really didn't inspire me to sit and wonder. Wow. 
How did she make that turkey so good and juicy? Uh, marvelous is another one. Marvel means to cause us to marvel. Um, when you look at something, you scratch your head and you like, wow, it's incredible. There's another one. Incredible. Incredible. Unbelievable, right? We, we use these words so casually and carelessly. Uh, another one is awesome. You know, everything's awesome. Everything is awesome. Awesome. That's an awesome tie. Sarah Grace did an awesome job coloring her picture in Sunday school, right? Everything's awesome. We used to have a, a little sort of a game and a rule that we had at, at our Christian school when we were up in McHenry. And uh, the kids would say, something's awesome. And I'd say, no, 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 it's not. No, only God is awesome. All right, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, it was good, it was cool. But, you know, not, not awesome. Everybody's grandchildren are awesome. No, they're not. No, they're not. I'm sorry. They're cute. They're adorable. Uh, not really awesome. Lucas is a lot of fun when he's being good, you know, but he's not awesome. Uh, he doesn't inspire me to sit in awe, you know. That's, I love him, but that, you know what I'm saying. So, and, and by the way, if you think that tacos are awesome, you, you really got to get out more. You really got to get out. I'm just telling you, you know. God, on the other hand, ought to inspire awe in us. He ought to make us marvel. He ought to cause us to be full of wonder when we try to contemplate who he was. That's why we, we spent the better part of this year talking about the divine attributes of God. And remember the very last one was the comprehension of God. How do we begin to understand who he is in all of his glory and his splendor? Well, anyway, let's get into the text, all right? Three simple points today. Let's look at it. Number one, his name, the Bible says, will be called Wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Uh, Judges, chapter 13 and verse 18. This is the story where uh, Manoah, an angel of the Lord, comes to Manoah. And you know who Manoah was? It was Samson's father. And announces that Samson and uh, that uh, Manoah and his wife are going to have a child. And he said, and, and so Manoah says to him, well, What is your name? What, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord, and by the way, when we read about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, most often, uh, most theologians believe that to be uh, an appearance, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's called a theophany, an appearance of God, or a Christophany, meaning a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And, and this is one of those instances where it says, the angel of the Lord very specifically, not an angel, but the angel of the Lord comes and is speaking to Manoah. And so Manoah says, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord says to Manoah, why do you ask me my name, seeing that it is wonderful? It's like that old line from the, I don't remember what movie it was, but, you know, I could tell you, but if I did, I'd have to kill you. You know, that kind of thing. You couldn't bear to hear my name. You couldn't speak it. My name is wonderful. Don't ask me my name. Jesus, the name given by uh, the angel to Joseph to give to Jesus. He says, call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua, Yeshua. It means Jehovah saves. And oh, by the way, you weren't allowed to pronounce well, I just said Jehovah. The, the Jews would have a, an abbreviation. It was called the Tetragrammaton, the J-H-W-H. Now, they didn't write vowels in their words anyway, but this one in particular was an abbreviation that was the covenant name of God. Remember when God revealed himself to Moses? He said, who shall I say sent me? God said, tell him I am sent you. You know, there's, there's three tenses of the word uh, in uh, I, I am to be Yahi Waha Vahi, I think it is. If I my Hebrew is very rusty, but it, it essentially means the one who is, the one who was, the one who will be, and that was the name. And so the Jews would never say it. And, and today we have 
this guy, we even to this day, we have disagreements about how to pronounce it. It should be Jehovah or Yahweh or whatever. It really was, I'm told, and I, again, my Hebrew is not what it ought to be, but I'm told that it was a, a, an exhale and an inhale and an, like, Yahweh, something like that, Yahweh. And, and so they would whisper it out of reverence. They would never pronounce it out loud. I found, you know, I was in uh, 86 or 87, I was just out of college and I got a job teaching uh, music with a company. It was called Music on the Move. And what we would do is we would go around to private schools in the Milwaukee area and where they didn't have music programs and, and our guys would go in and teach. Well, I was uh, teaching uh, this class one day at, at the Hillel Academy. Hillel Academy, very big, large, orthodox Jewish school up on the north side of the north shore of Milwaukee. Very ritzy neighborhood. Uh, beautiful old building. But anyway, uh, we were teaching recorder to a bunch of second and third graders. You know what a recorder is. It's like one of those flutes that you play. And the little girl in the class was named Bathsheba Glatt. She, and it's weird to think that Bathsheba is probably, what, almost 40 years old today, I guess. But, you know, anyway. So, but here she was in the class, and, and I said, well, you put your fingers on hold. Why do I have to put my fingers on the hold, she said. And I said, well, because that's how you change the notes. Well, then it's a second grader. And she said, why? I said, because when you blow in the tube, the air swirls around and, and the length of the tube determines what note is going to come out. Why? And I, so I started to explain to her the physics of music and how a long tube makes a, longer, a lower sound and a short tube. Why? And then after about the fourth or fifth why, I just said, well, because that's how God made it. <gasps> and the whole class just like, it was like they thought that lightning was going to come down and strike or something. I said, what's the matter? You said dog backwards. Yeah. And I realized, oh my goodness, yeah, this is an orthodox school. All the signs with Bible verses on them said, they didn't say God, they said G-D. You, you, you don't say the word God out loud. You don't pronounce the name of God, lest you should take it in vain. Our lips are unclean and unworthy to pronounce his name. The angel said, the angel of the Lord, who we believe was perhaps Jesus Christ, in his pre-incarnate state, said, what's your name? He said, I can't tell you my name because it's wonderful. It's wonderful. You're, you're not supposed to say his name out loud. It means God Almighty, the eternal Jehovah, Yahweh, stooped to earth to save a wretch like me. That wonderful name that the song says, angels brought down from heaven, they whispered it low that night long ago. That wonderful name, that beautiful name from sin has power to free us. That wonderful name, that beautiful name, that matchless name is Yeshua, Jesus. His name is wonderful. In Exodus 15 and verse 11, who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, and full of wonder? That's the name of Jesus. Number two. We're going to get into this more next week, but I'll just briefly introduce it today. He is wonderful in counsel. He is wonderful in his counsel. Okay? Uh, Dr. Ellicott, the commentator, said, Wonderful counselor is actually one name emphasized in the wisdom of Christ. Uh, I got it. We'll talk about that next week now. E.H. Plumpter, who is the dean of the School of Theology of Wales from in the late 1800s, said, he said this, Men should not merely praise the wisdom of Christ as they praise their fellows, but should adore and wonder at it as they wonder at the wisdom of God. Jesus is wonderful in counsel. You see, we'll look at this again next week. We have to stand in awe when we hear Jesus teaching. In fact, didn't they say, they were marveled, they marveled at him because he taught not like one of the scribes, but he taught with authority. Isaiah 11 and verse 1 says, There shall come a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. 
The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he shall make him of quick understanding and fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And reprove with equity the meek of the earth. He shall not smite the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Jesus is wonderful in his counsel. You remember how he confounded the Pharisees time and time again, how he taught with authority. So many times they would seek to trip him up, and they brought him, you know, they brought him a woman caught in adultery and said, you know, the law says, under the law she must die. What do you say? He sat down and he said, right. He sat down and he began to write with his finger in the ground. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say what he was writing, but most people assume that this was the finger of God writing, that he was writing out the Ten Commandments, the law. He wrote out the law on the ground and he stood up and said, now, whoever is without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And the Bible says they began to drop their stones from the oldest to the youngest and walk away until Jesus was the only one there, by the way, without sin, who was left with her. And he asked her, where are those that condemn you? And she said, they're gone, Lord. And he said, well, then I don't condemn you either. Go. Sin no more. Well, that didn't work. Then there was a time when someone said, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Well, now we've got him, right? If he says yes, He's going to rile up all the Jews. He's going to get all the Jews mad at him. But if he says no, then he's going to be in trouble with the government. So we've got him. So he's, what did Jesus, he said, oh, give me a coin. Let me see a coin. He said, Who, whose picture is this on the coin? As if he didn't know. And they said, well, that's Caesar's. And he said, well, then here, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Oh, Ooh. see what he just did there? Whose image are we created in? We're created in the image of God. So, yeah, you can give the coin to Caesar, but give yourself to God because you belong to him. So the Sadducees were up next. Sadducees, you remember them? They didn't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection. But they come to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, uh, there's a guy who's married. It sounds like he's going to tell a joke, right? He's married and, and uh, marries this woman, and then he dies. See? And so under the law, his brother was next up to take care of her. So she becomes the wife of the brother, and then he dies. Well, you see, the thing is, Lord, he came from a big family. He had seven brothers. And so the next one is up, and then he dies. And then the next one's up, and he dies. you got to wonder what this woman is cooking at home. But anyway, they all died off. And so when they all get to heaven in the afterlife, in the kingdom, who's she going to belong to? And Jesus said, hmm, haven't you read that Abraham, that, that, that God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Is he the God of the dead or of the living? And after all, in the afterlife, in the kingdom, it's not like here. Men don't marry and get are given in marriage, but they're like the angels. Now, it doesn't say they become angels. And don't We just watched Wonderful Life the other day. Don't, don't get too caught up in that. But it just means that that's not how it's going to be in heaven. Okay? You just don't get it. You don't get it. So they walked away shaking their heads. He says, you know, your problem is you don't believe in the afterlife. That's your problem. It's not that you don't understand whose, whose wife she should be. So then the Pharisees stepped up next. And this guy comes up and, oh, by the way, he was a lawyer. So we're playing for keeps now, right? So he says, okay. What's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said, good question. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, God, no. couldn't stump him. And they start to walk away. He says, wait, 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 come here. Come here. I got a question for you now. Uh-oh. Now it's going to get real. Let me ask you a question. Whose son is the Messiah? Well, son of David, of course. Okay, well then how come in the Bible it says David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. The Lord said to my Lord, 
Said, wait, wait, wait. Is, he, is he his son? If he's his son, how come he calls him his Lord? Why does David call him Lord in the spirit, under the inspiration of the spirit? So, so now they're scratching their heads and, and they, they didn't know. And then comes one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, they didn't ask him any more questions after that. He confounded them with his wisdom. He was wonderful in his counsel. He made them stand there with their jaws hanging open, open in wonder and amazement because he didn't teach like all the other scribes and the teachers. He taught as one with authority. He taught like he knew what he was talking about. And that caused them to wonder, who is this guy? He's never been to school. He hasn't received letters. Who is this? Number three, let me just go ahead and put it out, all right? Jesus is wonderful. Amen? Jesus is wonderful. I think the Hebrew language says that he is really, really wonderful. That's what it means. So let me talk about this. Just a few things. We'll kind of run through this. He's wonderful in his incarnation. John chapter 1, I quoted it earlier. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1, 14 says the Word became flesh. That's the incarnation. And dwelt among us. God became man. It's Christmas time. It's not the holiday season. It's Christmas time. It's about Jesus. Not about baby Jesus born in the manger. That's the child born. But about the son given. The fact that the eternal God Almighty became flesh and dwelt among us and kept his everlasting covenant and fulfilled it. See, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has set eternity in their hearts that we might not, that we might Cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The point is that God has given us all this innate sense of eternity. A sense that there's got to be something more out there, bigger than us. That's why even in Soviet Russia, all the atheists, when Lenin died, what they do? They put him in a glass coffin so they could preserve his memory. That's why the, the, the pharaohs were buried in pyramids with all sorts of stuff in there, you know, that... They packed up for them as they made their journey into across the, the river. What was the river called? I don't remember. Uh, Sticks. The river Sticks, right? Anyway, that's why we have all these ornate customs at funerals. And why you see people walking up to their departed loved one and talking to them as if they can still... It, I, I get it. There's a lot of things we do that don't make any sense. But it's all because we know that eternity is real. And the world deals with concepts of the afterlife in ways that are sometimes unusual and irrational. But it's because God has placed a sense of eternity in our hearts so that we might seek after him and grope for him. Jesus is wonderful in his counsel. Jesus is wonderful in his incarnation. If nothing else, he proves that there is something out there beyond this life. He's wonderful in his birth. Isaiah 7, 14 says, A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. How can that be? She'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us. Jesus was born God. God was born in Jesus. God existed in all of eternity and came to earth in flesh in the form of a baby who was born to a little 14 or maybe 15 year old virgin. She was overtaken by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says just as God creates life in us and just as God breathed life into the dust and created life in Adam, he breathed his breath, his spirit into this young girl, 13, 14, 15 years old who had never known a man. She had never been with a man. And his spirit overcame her and she conceived the son. Jesus is wonderful in his miracles. In fact, the Bible calls them signs and wonders, right? Signs and wonders. Wonderful in his life and his works. Full of wonders. There's a constant series of wonders and miracles recorded for us in the Bible. In John chapter 20 and verse 30 and 31, it says... Many other signs and wonders did he in the presence of the disciples, 
that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may know and that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have eternal life. The Bible says he did so many wonders. In fact, in chapter 21 and verse 25, it says so many wonders. If every one of them were written, I suppose the world could not contain all the books. We see his wonderful salvation. Matthew 21 and verse 42. Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing. And here it is. It's marvelous in our sight. It's marvelous. It causes us to marvel. Romans chapter 9. The stone the builders rejected. The Messiah. Jesus came to be the Messiah to the Jews. They rejected him. So through their rejection, salvation has come to us. Remember the closing of Romans chapter 11? Last week we, we read it. Oh, the depths and of both the riches and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he might be his counselor? Who has given to him that he might be recompensed again of him and through him and to him are all things to be glory forever and ever. Amen. About in his death. Jesus is hanging on the cross in Mark chapter 15 and verse 34. And he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Martin Luther famously said, God rejected by God? How can this be? That was God's plan, it was God's doing. It was marvelous in our sight. We have to stand in awe at the cross, the awesome cross. John 19 and verse 30, he said, it is finished. And he dismissed his own spirit. You know, you and I can't do that. Oh, we think we can. I, I've, you know, as an army chaplain, I've, I've dealt with a lot of soldiers that are contemplating suicide. And they want to take their own life. Sadly, some have. You know, Jesus dismissed his own spirit. It's impossible for you and for you and me to do that. I remember hearing uh, Dr. Charles Stanley talk one time about a man who wrote him. He said he was a, an over-the-road trucker and he was depressed. His wife had left him and he was having problems at home. And so he checked into a hotel and he was going to kill himself. He had a gun. He loaded the gun and he was lying on the bed and he just picked up the TV remote turned it on, and wouldn't you know, Dr. Charles Stanley was on preaching. And just at the moment he turned it on, Dr. Charles Stanley pointed it right at the camera and said, you can't kill yourself. What? And this man was so freaked out by that, he put the gun down and he watched the show till the end. And, you know, sadly things didn't change much at home, and he was still depressed, and he was, so this was a Sunday morning, so anyway, he got up and he Drove his route and later on checked into another hotel in a different city and now he was really going to do it. And just as he was going to do it, he picked up the TV remote, turned it on. And would you know, it was Dr. Stanley's broadcast once again, at the very moment, once again, where he pointed at the screen and said, you can't kill yourself. And the man was so freaked out, he put the gun down. He, he called his wife. I don't know whatever happened, but he didn't kill himself. And he wound up calling Dr. Stanley and telling him the story and you know, he never did kill himself. I guess he talked to a counselor and, I don't know, I'd like to believe he got saved. But You can't lay down your life. Jesus said it in John chapter 10 and verse 17. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down on myself. I have the power to lay it down and draw, take it up again. Do you know that Jesus died on the cross calling out with a loud voice when the cause of death in a crucifixion is suffocation? You can't cry out in a loud voice if you're suffocating. He died after, what, six hours on the cross? Normally a crucifixion, if it's done right, and believe me, they, the Romans knew how to do it, would take three, maybe four days. But after six hours on the cross, Jesus had, had enough. He said, you know, I'm done here. I'm out of here. It's finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He cried out in a loud voice, and he dismissed his own spirit. What about his love? Romans 5, 8. Unto us a child is born. 
Unto us a son is given. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love toward us. Toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. That's his salvation. And his resurrection was wonderful. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. It says, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how do some of you say that there's no resurrection? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is vain. We also are found to be false witnesses of God because we've testified that God raised up Christ whom he did not raise, if it so be that the dead did not raise. The dead rise not, is not Christ raised, risen, and if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have already perished, but if in this life we have hope in Christ, if in this life alone we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Ah, but then we come to verse 20. I call it the game changer. It says, but Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen from the dead. That's the good news. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on corruption, uh, incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? I've been talking to a soldier. His name is Specialist Hurst. I wish he'd pray for him. I was talking to him a couple of months ago, a drill. He was basically saying that he believed all religions were the same and that there was really no difference. And I said, yeah, I would believe that too, except for one thing, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. And he said, what do you mean? I said, Jesus rose from the dead. That's a historic fact. He said, what do you mean? You actually believe that? I said, yes, I do. He said, in all my years of being involved in, around churches, I've never heard anybody say they actually believe that. He said, if that were true, well, then Jesus must be God. And I said, yes, yes. He said, if I believed that, I'd become a Christian. I said, I know you would. And he said, but I can't believe it. I said, I know you can't. I know you can't unless God reveals it to you. We have to stand in awe and think that Jesus was dead and rose again. And because he lives, we too may live. That's wonderful stuff. And then his deity. His deity. 1 Timothy 3 and 16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. Great is the mystery. Without controversy, it says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was preached among the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world and received up into glory. God became flesh and dwelt among us. That's wonderful. Just try to comprehend that. Try to wrap your brain around that. Be like a dog chasing his tail. It, it. <sighs> Lastly, his love. I already mentioned it. His love is wonderful. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 6 says, Scarcely for a righteous man would some die. But while we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Perhaps for a good man, maybe some would die. But God demonstrates his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's another word, amazing. Amazing, as an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Why did Jesus die for you? Think about it. Why did he die for me? What good wears there in me? None whatsoever. Paul said, in my flesh there's no good thing. Why would Jesus die for me? Why would God in eternity past set his affection on me and choose me out of every atom in every cell that comprises my flesh there's nothing good not one atom when God created the universe he did it ex nihilo out of nothing and when God created righteousness in us he didn't find a little bit and work with it he created it out of nothing 
God chose to become flesh and take on a body of flesh and blood because the spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, flesh and blood. And without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. So he became flesh and dwelt among us. So he could die on the cross and shed that blood and that in eternity past, as a spirit, he didn't have, he, he came to take on flesh and blood so he could shed his blood to wash away my sins. By the way, he paid a debt that I owed to him. He took away the sins that I had committed against him. He not only wiped out my debt, he wiped out the debt that I owed to him. What wondrous love is this, O my soul. What wondrous love is this, O my soul. John 15 and 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. And Jesus said, I no longer call you my servants. No, you're my friends. You're a friend of God. Wesley wrote these words, And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's love? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Tis mercy all, the immortal dies. Tis mystery all, sorry, excuse me, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all, let us adore. Let angels' minds inquire no more. He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Charles Spurgeon wrote, when Jesus was born, well, Luke chapter 2 and verse 18, when Jesus was born, they all heard it, wondered at these things. So Spurgeon said, we must not cease to wonder at the great marvels of God. It would be very difficult to draw a line between holy wonder and real worship. For when the soul is overwhelmed with the majesty of God's glory, though it may not express it in song or even utter its voice with bowed head or humble prayer, yet it suddenly adores. Our incarnate God is to be worshipped as the wonderful one. That God should consider his fallen creature, man, instead of sweeping him away with the broom of destruction and should undertake, should himself to be man's redeemer and pay the ransom price, price is indeed marvelous. But to each believer, redemption is most marvelous as he uses it in his relationship to himself. It is a miracle of grace, indeed, that God, Jesus, would forsake the throne and royalty above and suffer ignominiously below for me. Let your soul lose itself in wonder, for wonder is, in this way, a very practical emotion. Holy wonder will lead you to worship and heartfelt thanksgiving. It will cause within you godly watchfulness. You will be afraid to sin against such love as this. Feeling the presence of the Almighty God and the gift of His dear Son, you'll put off your shoes from your feet because the place where you stand is holy ground. You'll be moved at the same time to glorious hope. If Jesus has done such marvelous things on your behalf, you'll feel that heaven itself is not too great for your expectation. Who can be astonished at anything when he has been astonished at the manger and the cross? What is there wonderful left after one has seen the Savior? It may be that the, from the quietness and solitariness of your life, you're scarcely able to imitate the shepherds of Bethlehem who told what they had seen and heard but you can at least fill out the circle of the worshipers before the throne and wonder at what our God has done. An old song, silly song, called I Just Go Nuts at Christmas. I think that song might have been written for me. I love the lights. I love all the lights on the tree and the wreaths and the music and Everything about I like the rat race. It's just everything about Christmas. All the excitement and anticipation. Put up the tree. Yeah, I know. It's a pagan thing. I get it. We got two trees in our house. We're really bad. 
But you know, here's what I tell, I tell people, here's what you do with your tree, all right? Turn off all the lights and sit in the dark and kind of stare at the tree and, and think about stuff. Christmas is a time of contemplation. I wonder as I, I wander, it's the song I played a few minutes ago. Think about this. God became man. The Word became flesh. The Eternal Father became the Son. God, who dwells in inapproachable light as a spirit, became flesh. The Ancient of Days, the Eternal God, was born into this world as a tiny baby. The omnipresent God who is everywhere was now wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Carried on the lap of a little 13 or 14 year old girl. King of kings and Lord of lords, the God of the universe became a servant. The shepherd became a lamb. The almighty one became a baby. Helpless, vulnerable, dependent, in the care of a young girl and her humble husband. He left a throne in heaven to come down to be born in stable and laid in a manger, to walk on this filthy earth and one day hang on a cross and die. The Holy One, the sinless one, became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God in him. You know what really makes it wonderful? And you can make your own list, all the ironies and paradises, but what really makes it wonderful is that he was born unto us. He was a child born unto us. He was the son given unto us. Unto us was born in the city of David, the savior. Christ the Lord. He is wonderful. He is great. But he's also full of wonders. George Beverly Shea said it. Oh, the wonder of it all, just to think that God should love me. He rules the world in truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Bow your heads and pray with me.